It is essentially a categorising of the data. And in fact, I, I think I said in an earlier session that I, I was quite kind of um, easygoing about the use of the terms like code and index and category and so on. And I use them interchangeably, and I do use them interchangeably. In grounded theory, the term category is used a lot. So that what you're doing to try to categorise the data, the codes are categorising. And that's, what, that's, what, that's the language that the grounded theorists are using. And hence, this categorising approach is a way to try to bring together everything that's about the same topic, that's doing the same thing, representing the same thing. I, it's coding. Where does it come from? Well, you've got to name the category, you identify it and decide what it's about. There is a big debate in, in the literature about this as well. Some people argue that grounded theorists argue you start with entirely open mind, um, that you don't... Um, kind of come with any kind of pre-existing theory at all, unlike last week analytic induction where I said you do. In grounded theory, you start with nothing, a, a blank slate, if you like, or a, a tabula rasa. Others would say you can't do that. And there are others in between who say you do it at a certain stage. And I think a lot of debate between, for example, Glazer on the one hand and and Sharmaz on the other, and Strauss and Corbyn in the middle somewhere, is about just where you draw that line. So I think at some stage, there's no reason why you can't bring in theoretical ideas. It may not be at the very beginning. You've got to leave a bit of an open mind to begin with. But certainly, um, Glazer says this, and, and Strauss and Corbyn, Corbyn certainly do as well, that at a certain stage of the analysis, maybe not early on in the interviewing, but at a certain stage of the analysis, you can begin to bring in theoretical ideas. Um, and that's perfectly legitimate for a grounded theorist to do that. You don't have to keep the theory completely aside. Um, and as I say later on, it's actually impossible to do that anyway. So bring in ideas from the literature, but try not to do it too quickly. Try not to prejudice yourself into certain directions by that, although that is hard not to do. Another source which um, Strauss and Corbyn mention is this uh, in vivo idea. Uh, and I've got an example of that coming up later on. In vivo means these are kind of ideas that come from the participants themselves, from the settings you're in investigating. Um, in vivo, you know, the Latin for in life. Um, so it's their concepts, it's their conceptualizations, maybe even their term, their word you're using to represent what's going on here. So it's very directly a form of understanding, a form of interpretation used by your participants, and you're simply using that. Not the words they use, perhaps, but nevertheless the concepts they're using. Oh, sorry, here's the example. <laughs> I didn't realise it was, I didn't read really lower down. This comes from uh, Strauss and Corbyn, uh, this particular example. Um, I, I should say, Glazer and Strauss's early work, um, the work they did that, that, that started grounded theory, was in hospital settings. They were looking at nursing in hospital settings. Um, and here's an example from that, 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 that setting, the, the so-called tradition bearer, uh, the nurse on the ward who inculcates new nurses into the rules of how you behave and how you act and so on on the ward. In fact, it turns out this is pretty true of a lot of organisations. There's always somebody who is there, who is the, whose job it is to inculcate the new people with how we do things in this department or on this ward or whatever. So tradition bearer is the name for a code and things that that person is doing are therefore coded as tradition bearer or tradition bearer's activities or whatever, um, or reference to tradition bearer. So this is an in vivo um, code. Now, I said earlier on, I talked about dimensions. Um, and here I want to talk a bit more about what that is. And this, this is, again, it comes from, um, particularly from Strauss and Corbyn. Um, they talk about the way that codes categories can be dimensionalized. As you collect what people are saying about some particular issue or some particular phenomenon that you've coded the same way, you begin to realize that those different examples have slight differences. There are different properties about them. Um, and in their book, in Strasser Comey's book, they talk about the way that color has properties. It can be, have different hue, tone, shade, intensity, and so on. Different dimensions of the, the thing that is colored it can be dark and light, and it can be large and small, and so on and so forth. In the same way, they say, your codes can have different dimensions. Um, they can be you know, about the same thing, but slightly different in certain ways, in certain respects. 
Um, and the example they give is that watching, so watching somebody, and you can imagine, I don't know, this maybe is um, in, a, um, I don't know, in a restaurant, the, the, the chief um, you know, cook might be watching over the trainee cook, the trainee chef, um, um, and watching what, what, what he or she is doing. Um, and that watching can have things like frequency, duration, extent, intensity, and so on, those kinds of things. So it could be you're watching for a long time, watching for a short time, watching casually, watching intently, etc. cetera. Um, information passing, another idea has amount of time, manner of passing, and so on. And once you start thinking like this, you realize that actually we're talking here about types of, kinds of, settings for, um, reasons for, um, you know, precursors of, all kinds of things like this, you can start to distinguish the, the codes uh, from each other. So they may be about the same thing, may all be about watching, but it can be different kinds of watching, for example, um, or watching in different circumstances, for example. So this is an important aspect of this kind of process of, of, of open coding, is to begin to to dimensionalize the codes and realize they can be about these different, different aspects of the same thing. I should say that um, in, uh, if you're using software or if you're doing something like um, template analysis, that idea is very well captured by having subcodes. So in the software, things like NVivo, you have subcodes or, or, or ch children codes, children nodes actually, of course, in, in NVivo. We saw that in when we, when we practiced with the software. Uh, in template analysis, you have a hierarchical coding system, and the, the subcodes can be the dimensions of the, of the main code. So, uh, you know, having that kind of hierarchical approach is a very good way of capturing dimensionalization. <laughs>